Sophia's third letter. Dear Yaristan, you should be happy to learn that Sabina's comment after she read your letter was, he's absolutely right. With this comment, Sabina lit a fuse on a stick of dynamite. Her comment gave rise to a discussion that lasted all night and to some of the most bitter arguments I've ever experienced. During this discussion, Sabina and Tina forced me to admit that I did actually make a choice of the type you described, a choice between Louisa and Ron, between the pedagogy you condemn and the individual act of rebellion you glorify. I had invited Louisa to supper as soon as your letter came. She read the letter as soon as she arrived, but the only comment she made during supper was, be sure to tell him how pleased I was to hear about Yasna. Tina read the letter when she got home from her job. While we ate, she didn't take her eyes off Louisa. She couldn't hide her impatience to see Louisa respond to all the critiques she made of her. Sabina didn't show any impatience at all. Have we institutionalized the letter reading party, she asked. Neither she nor Tina had read your previous letter when it came. When Sabina finally did read it after I sent my answer, she had been very excited to learn that the Myrna he married was Jan's sister. She told me, I knew her. She was a marvel. Our whole discussion revolved around the questions you raised in your letter. I can think of no better way to answer you than to give you an account of the discussion. Sabina's opening comment yields the expected response from Louisa. Absolutely right about what? About Manuel and Sedetic and Anton? They're obviously fictions. He's merely giving names to his ridiculous arguments. After all, he can tell us anything he pleases. He can tell Sophia her letter caused his arrest. He can tell us Mark Glavny and Adrian Povershan are television stars. From here, we can't prove otherwise. He did go out of his way to tell me he didn't think my letter caused his arrest, I insist. Tina grabs your letter, saying, not exactly, and finding the spot, she points out, he asked what Lem was doing there besides delivering your letter. I told Tina that as far as I knew, that was all Lem was doing. That doesn't exactly clear you, Tina points out. Louisa adds, Lem told me the investigators tortured him to find out who else he had letters for. Your letter was precisely what interested them. What does that prove, I ask her, that I was in fact responsible for Yaristan's arrest? It proves, Louisa says insistently, that Yaristan is using that ancient letter of yours to support arguments which Sabina considers absolutely right, specifically the reactionary argument that victims are responsible for their own oppression. I try to defend you. He's not using the letter that way. He doesn't mean that argument to be taken personally. The point he makes is perfectly clear to me. We don't always know the consequences of our acts. He doesn't say my letter caused his arrest. He says it might have. And he's right when he says I couldn't have imagined it might have such a consequence. You're apologizing for him, Louisa insists. His point is to make all of us responsible for the establishment of a police state. Now Tina comes to your defense by pointing out he doesn't exactly say that either. Louisa insists that's exactly what he does say. He insinuates it throughout his letter. Even that cryptic reference to George Alberts not being jailed is an accusation. Come off that, Tina objects. He says it was Sophia's reference to Alberts that was cryptic. She told him Alberts wasn't arrested. Well, I'm as surprised as Yaristan must have been. The last time you were here, you told me Alberts had been fired from his job just before you were all arrested, so I obviously assumed Alberts was arrested like the rest of you. Alberts obviously wasn't arrested, Louisa tells us. What's so obvious about it, Tina asks. It was Alberts who made our release possible. He couldn't have done that from jail, Louisa says. Does Yaristan know that? Tina asks. Of course he does, Louisa insists. And he acts as if all of us were suspicious because of that, as if all of us had conspired to keep him in jail. No, he doesn't, Tina says, handing your letter to Louisa. Read it again. You treat this letter exactly the same way he says you treat your past, by disregarding the facts. Really, Louisa, you're making him say the opposite of what he says, I point out. In both letters, Yaristan makes it clear that he had no reason in the world to suspect Alberts, that the suspicions was created by Claude. You're both leading me away from the point, Louisa insists. When Yaristan speaks of his suspicion of Alberts, he invariably uses words like suspicion and enemy, exactly the same way police use those terms. That's a different point, Sabina tells her, pouring each of us coffee. Don't interrupt me. In both letters, he drags his suspicion of Alberts. Well, it is a different point, Tina tells her. Then let me finish my different point, Louisa shouts. He says that whenever we consider someone suspicious, we hand him to the police to be shot. Whenever we consider someone an enemy, we carry out a pogrom. 
Sophia rightly told him our project was to communicate, not excommunicate. He turned that completely around. Tina interrupts again. He only said that he had seen a lot of people passively accept the arrest of their friends. That's what I'm talking about. Arrests and imprisonments are his whole frame of reference. It's the frame of reference of the police. When I'm suspicious of someone, I don't think of arrest and imprisonment. The point is to destroy the institution, not the individual. How do you do that? Tina asks. If you can't distinguish the institution from the individual, your unorthodox education didn't amount to much. I swallow the insult because I'm embarrassed for Tina, and my embarrassment grows when Tina asks, how do you distinguish between them? Tina's naive question transforms Louisa into the pedagogue you remember so well. A priest without a cloak or a church is merely an individual. Such a priest is like a child who doesn't know how to make anything useful. He ought to be treated like a child and taught to do useful things. What about a soldier or a boss or a bureaucrat, Tina asks. A soldier without a gun or an army is like a priest without a cloak or church. He should be kept from dangerous implements like a child from fire, but he should be given a chance to develop in other ways. What if he holds on to his implements and threatens to kill you? Exasperated, I asked Tina, what are you getting at? Either I'm defending violence or I'm lost, Tina tells me. She crashes down in her chair when Louisa and I laugh at her. Sabina doesn't laugh. What is your point, Louisa? Yaristan uses terms like suspicion and enemy the way the police use them. So? He can use terms any way he pleases. I don't mean the same thing by them, Louisa tells her. A person who says one thing and means another is a hypocrite. That statement summarizes Sabina's view of Louisa. Take the slogan, factories should be administered by the workers themselves. What about it, Louisa asks. What do you mean by it, Sabina asks her. I certainly don't mean Genghis Khan for boss. I mean exactly what the slogan says, Louisa shouts. Yet all those factories are now bossed by Genghis. Not because of me, Louisa shouts. Who installed them, Sabina asks. The new bosses obviously weren't installed by the very people who fought against them, Louisa answers. Sabina asks, did you ever meet anyone who fought to install a new boss? Some people fought with nothing but words. In practice, in practice, they carried the same placard you carried, Sabina tells her. I intervene in favor of Louisa. That's not fair, Sabina. Some of the people who carried those placards knew perfectly well that their own party leaders were going to set themselves up as new bosses. Were some of those people workers? Sabina asked me. I didn't say they weren't. Some workers looked forward to the day when their politician would be boss, I admit. But the overwhelming majority of workers opposed the establishment of new bosses, she asked me. Obviously, I insist. You know that as well as I do. Then why didn't the overwhelming majority throw out the new bosses as soon as they installed themselves, Sabina asks me. According to Yaristan, only the workers of a single town rose against those bosses during the past 20 years. The fact that those workers rose proves that the workers were opposed to the new bosses, I argue. Really? Sabina asks sarcastically. Doesn't it prove that all other workers submitted to the new bosses? They were overpowered, I insist. Yes, they were, precisely because all other workers acquiesced. If workers had risen in all the towns, no force could have overpowered them. While saying this, Sabina leaps out of her chair, grabs me and then Tina by the waist, and starts tugging us towards the kitchen. Your place is in the kitchen, she shouts. Let go of me, Tina shouts, pulling herself loose, while I scream, Sabina, what's gotten into you? Sabina lets me go. Then she points towards the kitchen door and, trying to act like an army officer giving a command, says, Louisa, Tina, take Sophia into the kitchen, on the double. What on earth for, Louisa protests. Have you gone crazy? And you're telling me a handful of politicians can give orders to the majority of workers without the majority's acquiescence, Sabina asks. While Sabina glares triumphantly at Louisa, Tina slyly slips behind Sabina, gets on all fours and nods to me. I give Sabina a slight push and she falls flat on her back. Tina slips out from under Sabina's legs, raises Sabina's hand and proclaims, The loser! Louisa and I laugh and applaud. This is to be Louisa's only moment of relief. Remaining stretched out on the floor, Sabina tells Louisa and me, this is what happens to a jailer when the majority doesn't want jailers. You think the majority didn't want jailers back then? But Yarstown is right. You're nursing an illusion. Sophia, you didn't believe Lem when he told you he'd been tortured. What about you, Louisa? Did you become disillusioned with those fellow workers when Lem told you about the tortures? Lem wasn't tortured by workers, but by inquisitors, by prison officials, Louisa insists by workers who obeyed the orders of prison officials. 
That's how Yaristan sees it, Louisa tells her. Why did you disobey me when I ordered you to drag Sophia to the kitchen? Sabina asks her. You unprincipled. Try again, Sabina shouts to her. Would you two like to fight it out with knives or do you want guns? Tina asks, but her joke goes unappreciated. You spent your whole life among hoodlums. You have no right to breathe a word about workers who fought to free themselves. Saying this, Louisa gets up, turns her back to Sabina and walks towards the bookcase. Sabina turns to me. Next time you write Yaristan, ask him to tell you more about Manuel. Ask him how many friends he had when he refused to obey or the orders of the union leaders. Ask him if they were the majority. Ask him if those friends were hoodlums, like Ron and I. Keeping her back to Sabina, Louisa snaps. There aren't any hoodlums like Ron or you among genuinely revolutionary workers. Ask Yaristan, Sabina continues. If Manuel's friends wanted to take pot shots at the union leaders the way that resistance fighters shot at the new occupiers, ask them if they wanted to deal with the union officials the same way you and Tina dealt with me. What will that prove, I ask? Ask him which side liquidated those friends of his. Ask if they were shot by the army generals or by the revolutionaries who spoke in the name of the workers. But it's perfectly clear who killed them, I insist. Who, Sabina asks. While I say the generals... Tina simultaneously says, the revolutionaries. Sabina wins another bout, and as if she had suddenly gone over to her side, Louisa blurts out, there were obviously enemies behind the lines as well as across the trenches. Really, Sabina pounces, enemies who were shot? I thought enemies were defrocked and treated like little children. They were paid enemy agents who murdered revolutionary workers and sabotaged production, Louisa continues. And what happened to them, Tina asks. They were shot. But a while ago, you said you didn't use the term enemy that way. It's Tina's turn to embarrass Louisa. Not embarrassed in the least, Louisa continues. If those saboteurs and assassins hadn't been caught, the revolution would have been defeated right at the start. Then why did everyone laugh at me before, Tina asks. Disregarding Tina, Sabina plunges in. Such saboteurs and assassins were an even greater threat to the revolutionaries than the attacking militarists, weren't they? I try to warn Louisa that Sabina is leading her into a trap, but Louisa insists on walking right into it. That's right, such people were in the greatest danger. The militarists were visible enemies. They were openly reactionary. They were on the other side of the trenches, whereas these weasels were indistinguishable from workers. They infiltrated union meetings and workers' militias. They paraded as the greatest revolutionaries. Usually they couldn't be spotted until after they had done their deeds or proclaimed their reactionary programs. You just said there weren't any such people in that revolution, Tina observes. There weren't, says Sabina. Destructive hoodlums like Ron didn't exist because they were all shot by the good revolutionaries. I protest, Yaristan didn't say anything like that. Ask him, Sabina insists. Ask him what Manuel's friends were like and who shot them. Louisa is intent on continuing her argument. Yaristan compares a great historical rising of the working population with the petty thievery of a hooligan. He damns revolutionaries and glorifies gangsters. Jan, Manuel, Ron, and Yaristan himself are types that become shock troops of reactionary movements. Deliberately disregarding Louisa's newest observation, Sabina asks me, What did you tell him about Ron? Louisa says, You obviously glorified Ron in your letter to Yaristan. No, I didn't, I tell her. I only described Ron. I told him Ron stole bicycles. To Yaristan, those thefts were individual acts of rebellion. It was Yaristan who glorified him. And you never saw him as a rebel, Sabina asks me. Well, yes, I did at the beginning, I admit. I compared him to Yaristan and I glorified both. But I was wrong about Ron. When did you know that, Sabina asked me. I knew it before that night when I walked away from both of you. The night when you told me I was just like Louisa. Did you bother to remember that over all these years, Sabina asked me. I wrote it down so as never to forget it. You had no right to say that. Louisa asks, was that insulting to you? Leaving me no chance to answer, Sabina says, you wrote it down wrong. I said that before you walked away from us, before the car was wrecked, you were an ass that night. I thought you and Ron had just made love on the beach. Ron and I swam together and that was all. Surely you know that now. Ron knew what you'd think. He said if you suspected your best friends without asking them anything, he was through with you. Louisa says to me, it's a good thing you walked out on them or you'd have stayed with that nest of Tina cuts her short. Don't say it, please. You're talking about the people who gave me food, love, and shelter, who made me what I am now. They were not a nest. They were the great sages of the age. 
Feigning an upper-class air, she continues, If you would care to compare my wit with that of your own protege, sitting on your immediate left, I would be glad to demonstrate. Tina, I whisper, embarrassed for Louisa because Sabina is roaring with laughter. I can hardly keep myself from bursting out laughing, but Louisa looks miserable. I'm here too, you know, Tina pleads. Something in me explodes. I know you are. So am I. Louisa, you have no right to call our friends a nest of anything. My weeks with Ron were the only happy weeks I spent here until I left for college. Yes, happy, filled with activity, with humor, with life. When I lost Ron and Sabina, my insides emptied. I spent my time staring like an owl. You thought everything was fine because we talked about the past every evening. Please don't get up to leave, Louisa. I enjoyed our discussions, and they meant a great deal to me, but I didn't want to live only in the past. I wanted a present as well. No, you didn't keep me from anything. You prohibited nothing. I knew I could do whatever I pleased and leave whenever I wanted, but I didn't want to tell you our evening talks weren't enough for me. I didn't want to tell you I loved Ron. Sabina interrupts me. I never thought. I'm not done yet, I tell Sabina. If Ron loved me, he loved only half of me. He rejected the other half. I knew that long before that night we went to the beach. Ron knew it, and you knew it too. It was all so obvious to me on the night of that school theft when you and Ron came to the house with the two bikes you wanted me to keep for you. I hadn't seen either of you for almost a year, and Ron didn't even show his face. You didn't tell me what you were doing or where you were going. The two of you used me, but you didn't trust me. That's not the way you treat what you're calling your best friend. Louisa asked Sabina, Did you take part in that school theft? I turned angrily to Louisa. Is that what you heard me say? Yes, yeah, she took part in it. So did I. Even you were an accomplice in it. Don't play Sabina's games on me, Louisa shouts. I'm not playing games, I shout back. One night, after you had gone to sleep, I woke up with a start because someone was throwing pebbles at my window. I looked out and saw Sabina grinning innocently, as if throwing pebbles at windows at that time of night were perfectly normal. I ran to the door and let her in. I thought something horrible had happened. Sabina calmly brought two bicycles in. Would you mind keeping these for half an hour? And please leave your door unlocked. That's exactly what you said then, Sabina, and you said it with that same grin. Since you remember it so well, tell me why you came alone. Why didn't Ron come with you? What was I to Ron then? Do you also remember what state you left me in? I stood by the door trembling during the entire half hour. I felt as if several hours had gone by. I was sure you'd tell me what happened as soon as you got back. I was so sure you'd explain everything that I wasn't prepared to stop you from leaving before you told me anything. But you came back with that same demonic grin and all you said was, No, don't remind me. How could I forget? Thanks a lot. That's all. You vanished with the bikes before I could open my mouth. I never felt so humiliated. I thought you had completed the blow you had begun to strike at me the night we went to the beach. The following morning I preferred to think I had a nightmare. Louisa points a shaking finger at Sabina. You had the nerve to use my house for that theft? Turning to me, she asks, and you helped her? That wasn't what bothered me, I shout. Ron was in jail before I learned what had happened. That was what bothered me. Sabina, why didn't you tell me what you and Ron had done? Why did I have to go see you after Louisa told me there was a story in the paper about that awful Ron? Sabina reminds me, you came to Albert's house before the trial. The story was in the paper after the trial. But I already knew about the robbery when I went to see you. Lem and Sal told you about it, she reminds me. That's right. The police had contacted Debbie Matthews. She told Lem about it. At the end of a class, Lem told me. They've caught the lump in. He'll be on trial next week. I left school and ran directly to your house. George Albert's house, she corrects. To me, it was your house. I was furious. I wanted to let you know how mad I was for letting me stand behind my door trembling, staring at the two bikes. You said come in as nonchalantly as if nothing had happened. I was boiling. Well, what did you do? Tina asked me. Nothing, because I saw a tiny shrieking bundle on the couch and I forgot everything I intended to shout. I asked Sabina who it was. You asked what it was, Sabina reminded me. The bundle was you, Tina, brand new. My, what an exciting story, Tina says sarcastically. Has it all been building up to my grand entry into the world? Sorry to disappoint you, Tina. As l soon as I learned what you were, I lost interest in you. I've never been fascinated by people who only know how to goo and pee. Neither have I, so you don't have to apologize, Tina says. I remembered why I was there, and some of my fury returned. Sabina continued to act as if nothing had happened. She still didn't tell me. Tell you what, Sabina asked, purposely acting out the role she had played then. That's what you said. Tell you what? Of course I knew about the robbery by then. 
I wanted you to tell me why you'd let me stand behind my door waiting ignorantly. But without saying a word, you led me down to your basement. I was stunned. It was full of bike parts, motors, and all kinds of other junk. It smelled like grease and paint. I again forgot what I'd come to ask. I asked if you'd stolen all those things, and you said you'd stolen half. When I asked what you did with it all, you said you repaired some things, changed others, and then sold them. My anger disappeared. For some reason, I thought everything was clear, but nothing was. Louisa mutters, Is this what Yaristan considers heroic acts of individual rebellion? Stealing from working people and school children is worse than scabbing. That was how I felt when I walked home from Sabina's after she showed me her basement, I admit. I understood Rod wasn't what I thought he was. He wasn't a rebel. He was no different from any unscrupulous businessman. Rod and I both knew that was how you felt, Sabina tells me. Is that why you didn't tell me anything? Were you afraid I'd give Ron away to the police, I ask? If that was the extent to which he trusted me, how can you tell me I was his best friend? What difference would it have made if I had known? It was his own fingerprints that gave him away. Ron wasn't arrested or convicted because of those fingerprints, Sabina says mysteriously. The prosecutor had no way to connect the fingerprints with the robbery. You mean you stole that lens, I asked Sabina. We both stole it, she said. Ron climbed into the principal's office through the window. I stayed across the street and kept watch. And he left his fingerprints all over that slide projector, I point out. It was the lens of our brand new movie projector, Sabina said. The school had bought it mainly for George Albert's science class. How did Ron know that, I asked. He was no longer in school. Ron had seen it when he had first arrived, she explains. Shortly before he quit school, he was called to the principal's office for having frightened a teacher. He was kept locked in the office for over an hour. He was alone with the projector. He studied it and unscrewed the lens, but he screwed it right back because he knew he'd be caught if he took it. Tina asks her, but why did he leave his fingerprints on it the night he stole it? Didn't he know? Sabina answers, he didn't leave them that night. He wore gloves when he climbed into the principal's office. He came out with the lens, showed it to me, and threw it into a garbage can. It was carried off by the garbage truck the following morning. Tina anticipates my question. What? He threw it away? Then why did he steal it? Because Debbie had been fired from her job, Sabina explains. Ron quit school when that happened, but he wanted to do more. He talked of bringing the school down. Then he remembered the projector. Why couldn't you have told me that at the time? I plead. Because we thought your response would be identical to Louisa's. Stealing from the children of the working class. We didn't need that kind of wisdom. We wanted the trial to expose the school officials who had fired Debbie as a subversive. At the trial, we were going to show they had arrested Ron without any evidence, merely because he was the son of a subversive. How could you have done that, I asked. They found his fingerprints all over the machine. Ron hadn't ever been arrested before, so they didn't know whose fingerprints they had found, Sabina explained. They had arrested him because he was Ron Matthews, the notorious hoodlum, son of Debbie Matthews, the subversive. But the fingerprints they found did turn out to be his, I insist. They couldn't have been his if he wore gloves on the night of the robbery, Tina points out. Debbie had gotten Ron a lawyer, and Sabina says, Ron told the lawyer he had been locked in the principal's office with the projector for an hour. The lawyer checked into that and found it to be true. Ron told him he'd played with the projector from boredom during that hour. The lawyer wasn't only convinced of Ron's innocence. He said there was no way they could prove Ron stole the lens. Ron wasn't convicted because of those fingerprints, but because of that ass he had for a father. I remember it now, Tina shouts. Jose told me all about that trial. Ron's father lied like a cop and got the judge to convict Ron without even listening to the testimony. Suddenly, I remember that trial, too. Everything I had found so strange about it at the time becomes clear. The strangest thing of all was that, except for the judge and Tom Matthews, I seemed to be the only person in the courtroom who thought Ron was guilty. I went to the trial with Lem. Sabina was already in the courtroom alone. She sat in the front row near the bench where Ron was going to sit when he was brought in. I recognized Tom Matthews when he came in. He sat down at the opposite end of the front row. I thought of his wrecked car and cringed. He didn't recognize me. A woman Louisa's age came in, visibly drunk. She held on to the young man who came in with her. Lem nudged me and whispered that she was Debbie Matthews. I told Lem I wanted to meet her, and the jerk introduced me as Sabina's sister. Debbie mumbled that she hadn't known George Alberts had two daughters, and she glared at me with hatred. I tried to tell her I wasn't exactly Sabina's sister, but failed to communicate anything. The young man with her said, Hi, I'm Jose. I'm not exactly Ron's brother. A man with a briefcase came in and whispered something to Debbie. Then he sat down in the center of the front row and spread out papers. He was obviously the lawyer.
After the judge came in and asked everyone to stand, Ron was brought in, escorted by a policeman. Ron looked around. When he saw me, he smiled. I didn't return his smile. I was mad at him for not telling me about the robbery. His smile turned to a frown, and he looked away from me. When he saw Jose, he grinned and waved his fist as if to say, We'll get these bastards. I heard Jose whisper to Debbie, Don't worry, they won't get him. I didn't understand that. I knew Ron had done it. The only thing in question was the length of the sentence. Luisa responds to Tina's last comment by shouting, How can you have such a twisted picture? Ron stole that machine, not his father. That hoodlum got exactly what he deserved. Tina reminds her, I thought, in your view, no one deserved to go to jail. If countless working men are imprisoned daily for stealing food for their children, Luisa retorts, it would have been the grossest injustice if this boy had been set free after stealing from a public school. Was that what I thought at the time? If so, I can't blame Ron and Sabina for not telling me anything. I thought the trial was ugly, but it seemed that no one could have expected another outcome. The trial seemed like a pure formality. The prosecutor gave a short speech, arguing that the evidence proved Ron was guilty beyond any shadow of a doubt. He said Ron was a hardened criminal of long standing and that his behavior had to be reformed so that he wouldn't continue to endanger the lives of honest citizens and their children. Ron's defense seemed petty to me. I considered his lawyer's arguments sophistic and irrelevant. When Ron was called to the stand, his lawyer asked where Ron had seen the movie projector. Ron told the story of his imprisonment at the principal's office. He admitted playing with a projector at that time. The lawyer asked Ron if he'd seen the projector after that, and Ron said he hadn't. I didn't blame Ron for saying that, but I didn't see how anyone would believe him. The lawyer then called the police investigator to the stand and asked if Ron's fingerprints had been found anywhere else in the room. They hadn't. The lawyer sat down, evidently satisfied with himself, though I couldn't imagine why. The prosecutor called Ron to the stand. He asked Ron if he was in school. No. Did he work? No. That was all he asked Ron. He called Debbie Matthews. She obviously wasn't prepared for that. Do you mean me? She asked. She could barely walk to the stand. Ron's lawyer objected, but the judge overruled him. The prosecutor asked Debbie if she was Ron's mother, and she said she was. Then he asked her two more questions. Had she been dismissed from the high school? Yes, she had. Would she describe the reason for her dismissal? The lawyer objected and was overruled again. She defiantly announced she had been dismissed for inciting school children to overthrow the government violently. The thought that passed through my mind was that all of the people in that room, Debbie and Lem, were probably the strongest supporters of government. They worshipped the state. How ludicrously ironic. That was all the prosecutor wanted to know from Debbie. He called Tom Matthews to the stand. He asked if Ron lived at home. Matthew answered, no, he doesn't. I asked him to leave about a year ago, Your Honor, because I found out he was stealing and storing his stolen goods in the basement of my house. I heard Jose whisper, that bastard. The judge must have heard him, too, because he turned to Jose and wrapped his wooden hammer on his table. Then the judge told Matthews to continue. I should have reported him at the time, Your Honor, especially when he boasted he was going to put a stick of dynamite in the wall of the school. The judge wrapped his hammer again. He announced he wouldn't listen to any more evidence. The trial was over. He gave Ron six months in reform school and a large fine. Debbie later paid the fine. Ron's lawyer looked stunned. He shouted that he objected, but the judge got up and left the courtroom. While Ron was being escorted out, he looked helplessly at Jose and Debbie. Jose's eyes were red with anger. Debbie was as pale as a sheet. Tom Matthews stormed out of the courtroom as soon as the judge left. Matthews looked victorious. He'd gotten his revenge for the wrecked car. I wasn't surprised by what he had done. Sabina remained sitting in her corner, sobbing. I had never seen her cry. Debbie and Jose didn't budge. They stared at the absent judge. They both looked hypnotized, or as if they had just seen someone run over by a truck. Lem and I got up and left. No one looked at us. I had the strange feeling that something had happened that I hadn't understood. The following day, Louisa handed me the newspaper and asked, Isn't this the boy you brought to the house? I acted surprised. I tried to give her the impression that I hadn't thought Ron capable of such an act. I didn't tell her the bicycles had been at our house on the night of the robbery, nor that I had been to the trial. I told her I had been wrong about Ron. And that was exactly what I felt. Wrong, wronged, and cheated. The Ron I had once looked for, found, and loved wasn't the Ron I had just seen in the courtroom. I had looked for the Ron described in your letter, the insurgent, the rebel who rejects all social institutions through his acts. I had found such a person. My picture of him wasn't destroyed when I learned he stole bikes, since he didn't steal them from boys who couldn't afford to buy chains. 
but the Ron I saw at the trial was no insurgent. He didn't steal from the rich, but from his likes. He was a gangster who stole for money. The only thing he had in common with the genuine insurgent was that he was going to become a permanent fugitive from the police. He was going to live his life in an environment consisting of prisons and courtrooms. But unlike an insurgent, his activity was going to remain irrelevant to the struggle against the institutions of which prisons and courtrooms were mere symptoms. I was relieved that I wasn't Sabina, sitting and sobbing in that courtroom. I was relieved that in six or seven months, I was going to leave the high school, the neighborhood, and Louisa, relieved that I was going to move to a new environment where I would find new problems, perhaps new friends, possibly even worthwhile projects, projects which would be in some meaningful way the projects of an insurgent. I saw Ron for the very last time, just before the school year ended. Sabina again threw pebbles at my window at night. Both she and Ron were outside. They refused to come in. I got dressed and went out. In spite of everything I had felt, in spite of all my pent-up anger, I was overjoyed to see them. I threw my arms around Sabina and cried. It was the first time I had let Sabina know I didn't hate her. She must have been as surprised as I was. I gave Ron my hand. He pulled me to him and kissed me. Fighting tears and trying to smile, I said, Didn't I tell you I'd come out to meet you any time of day or night? Lady, would you repeat that, he asked. Only if you say my name correctly, I sobbed. Sophie Nachello, he said, and kissed me again. Suddenly, he asked, Does that mean you trust me? I remembered how angry I had been because he hadn't trust me. I didn't answer. He became stiff and let me go. We started walking. Sabina broke the silence. Ron wanted to tell you about the people he met in reform school. I said, really? With feigned indifference. I immediately regretted saying it. I would have loved to listen to Ron's observations about reform school. I had always loved to listen to his observations. That, really, deprived me of my last chance to hear them. Ron had heard every nuance of meaning I had put into that single word. With undisguised hostility, with a tone in which he might as well have said, so you've joined the police, he said, I hear you're going to college. That was the last thing he said to me. He didn't want an answer or an explanation. He seemed to become deaf and dumb. We walked on in silence. Everything had been said. But Sabina became impatient. Go in and tell her, she insisted. But Ron shook his head. He didn't intend to say another word that night any more than I had intended to accept a ride on the bar of his bicycle on the night of the car wreck. Sabina did all the talking. She told me he had met teenage scientists, engineers, artists, and acrobats. The best minds of our time are in that reform school. One mind had especially impressed Ron, a boy called Ted. Sabina, trying unsuccessfully to imitate Ron, described Ted as a genius who could pick the lock of any brand new car and get the car started in less than a minute. The guy he worked with drove the car into his garage, where he and Ted dismantled it into parts. Ted was caught only because he had stolen a sports car and driven his girlfriend around the city with it in broad daylight. His girlfriend was only ten, and Ted didn't look much older. As soon as Sabina began, I was sorry she was telling me these things instead of Ron. How badly I wanted to hear the story in Ron's own words, with his characteristic comments and digressions. Sabina's erudite, perfectly grammatical narrative sounded so artificial. She took all of Ron's spirit out of his experiences. I felt miserable for having ruined my chance to hear about these experiences at first hand, but I resented having to hear a second-hand account. Whenever Sabina paused, I cut her and Ron with that same word, really? My tone communicated to Ron immediately. I couldn't have been more explicit if I had told him I resented being woken so late at night merely to be told such boring trivialities. Ron told Sabina, oh shit, let's go home. They walked me home. No one said a word. I wanted to ask Ron to tell me again what Sabina had just told me, but the gap between us had grown too large. Ron and I both knew it. Only half of me wanted to hear Ron describe the greatest minds of the age. The other half saw a Ron who had graduated from bicycles and was moving on to cars, a Ron who was about to become a professional criminal. I saw a person who was in no sense a rebel, a person who didn't feel comradeship and solidarity with his fellow beings, a person to whom others are mere objects to be used the way he'd used me on the night of the school theft. That night, Ron knew as well as I did that only half of me wanted to hear about his new adventure, to share his observations, to laugh with him, and to explore possible projects with his new friends. He recognized the other half as the dominant half, the real Sophia. That half was a stranger to him, a hostile stranger, an outsider. Ron's, I hear you're going to college, was equivalent to, oh shit, when the hell did I have anything to do with anyone like you? I was an alien to his world, his friends and his projects. Telling me about his newest experiences was a mistake. 
Oh shit, let's go home, man. Oh shit, let's not waste time talking to this teacher. Let's get out of here. This is like telling a cop what we intend to steal next. I asked Sabina, couldn't you at least have told me Ron had only stolen that lens because of what they had done to Debbie? It wasn't up to me to tell you anything, Sabina answers. Ron was dying to tell you, but you didn't once visit him in jail before the trial, and you didn't once go to see him in reform school. I knew he'd want you to join us when he came out of reform school, but I also knew all you'd say would be, really? You were spending your time with that nitwit Lemisol. It was clear to everyone but Ron that you had made your choice. Yaristan's letter describes that choice perfectly. You had already chosen to join the moralists, the priests, the judges. He was an idiot not to see that. By the time of the trial, you were as repelled by him as Louisa was. If we told you we intended to win the trial and have Ron emerge innocent, if we told you we intended to expose the persecution of Debbie, what would you have done? I expected you to start shouting about the injustice and immorality of causing a poor working man to be persecuted for a crime Ron had committed. Sabina is probably right. By the time of Ron's trial, I had already made my choice. But I don't think either you or Sabina are right about the nature of that choice. I don't think I chose between Ron and what you call pedagogy. I certainly didn't choose pedagogy in the conventional meaning of that term. That kind of pedagogy didn't appeal to me at all. The people I admired, you, Louisa, Nachello, Sabina, Ron, had never even finished high school. George Alberts was the only pedagogue I'd ever been close to, and I couldn't stand him. Maybe Louisa was a type of pedagogue, too. I understand what you mean in your letter, but I can't apply it to my own life. During my last year in high school, I didn't see Louisa the way you describe her, nor did I choose between Ron and Louisa. If I rejected Ron at that time, I rejected Louisa as well. I rejected the prospect of spending my days in the factory dreaming of the day when the general strike would put an end to wage labor. It was precisely the experiences and hopes I had learned from Louisa that made me permanently unable to accept the boredom, the scheduled routine, the supervision, and the submission. I rejected both Ron and Louisa, but I didn't affirm official pedagogy. I didn't challenge Ron's observation that the greatest scientists, engineers, and artists were in reform school. I knew already then that great literature wasn't created by textbook writers or experts in creative writing, that great discoveries weren't made by the bureaucrats called researchers, that revolutions weren't carried out by academics who dreamt of governing society the way they govern their classes. Ron, the high school dunce, was more perceptive and resourceful than I was ever going to become. And in terms of sheer information, Sabina already then knew more than I was going to learn during all my years in college, even though she hadn't ever finished elementary school. She had pumped out of George Alberts every scrap of physics, chemistry, and biology he had ever learned. She and Alberts had converted the entire second story of their house into a laboratory and a library. And then Sabina abandoned all that and joined the greatest minds of the age, minds capable of driving off with a brand new car in less than a minute in broad daylight on a crowded street. She spent several years living in an underworld that you seem to glorify abstractly. You characterize as individual acts of rebellion what to me looked like theft, constant fleeing, and prostitution. Maybe I've always been as narrow as Louisa about this possibility. Sabina offered me this alternative two years after Ron died, and I rejected it for the second time. Maybe I never really understood that alternative. All I do know is that at some point Sabina rejected it as well. Maybe I'm not as self-assured about my choice as I was then, but either you nor Sabina have convinced me that the choice I made was wrong. What I looked for wasn't related to the official purpose of the university, although I admit I did have some vague hopes that by studying history and sociology, I had at least clarify my own and Louisa's past experiences. The first few months of classes knocked these hopes out of me. About this, at least, I don't disagree with you. State functionaries do see the world from their offices. All their textbooks and all their lectures celebrated the existing social order. The apparatus they called knowledge seemed to have been created expressly for the purpose of making the overthrow of the social order appear inconceivable. Everything I valued was considered dangerous and violent. I entered the university at a time when the normal, barracks-like life of this medieval, monastic institution was supplemented by modern forms of militarization. Numerous professors were directly in the pay of the armed forces. Whole branches of activity that had once been scholarly pursuits were transformed into weapons development factories. Physics, chemistry, biology, anthropology, sociology, and psychology. Instead of being taught to formulate questions, students were being bombarded with answers. Open apologists for capital and for the state treated their classrooms as pulpits from which to give sermons eulogizing the official religion. Students were brainwashed into believing the state's enemies were their own enemies. 
Critics of every shade, even state worshippers of a different brand, were systematically prevented from speaking. Male students were actually recruited directly into the armed forces when they enrolled in the university. Military training became another academic discipline. Several professors were fired for refusing to swear to serve the state unconditionally. All the professors who remained signed the oath. They swore to lie systematically, to distort and falsify whatever threatened the interests of the state. No, I didn't go to the university because of anything it had to offer. I went there because I rejected Ron's world and Luis's world, not because I saw a community in the military enclave that exists only to destroy community. I went there because I'd hoped to find others like me, others who had rejected what I had rejected. The community I wanted to find was a community of people whose choices were similar to mine. I looked for people with whom to shape meaningful responses to the world we rejected, Responses which went beyond sheer opportunism for the sake of survival. I made the mistake of moving into a dormitory. I stayed there for three months. It was the closest thing to prolonged imprisonment that I've experienced. I did learn to play pranks, but even then I couldn't endure that regime of rules and regulations to which I had never in my whole life been subjected. I couldn't afford to rent an apartment of my own. Then I found some women students who owned a house and ran it on a cooperative basis. Those who could afford to pay less did more of the housework. I washed dishes and got free room and board. My first friend was my roommate at the co-op, Rhea Morphin. I liked her very much at first, mainly because of how enthusiastic she was about me. I suppose you always like people who think a lot of you. She made me tell the story of my life at least a dozen times during my first few weeks at the co-op. The fact that my mother worked in an auto plant and supported me already recommended me to Rhea. She was even more impressed by the fact that my mother had never finished high school and that my sister hadn't finished elementary school and that my father hadn't ever spent a single day in school. Rhea's perpetual comment was, I don't believe it. But after a few weeks of being admired as such a perfect proletarian, I got sick of her admiration and when I learned more about her, I resented it. It turned out that she was a member of the same political church as Lem Isel, that she and Lem were friends and that Lem was responsible for the fact that Rhea and I were roommates. Rhea perfectly fits your portrait of the politician. Her world was populated by constituents and leaders. In her eyes, I was a perfect constituent, a potential cadre, a potential rank-and-file leader, a full-fledged proletarian intelligent enough to understand the dialectic and to know how to interpret it to my fellow rank-and-filers. Her father was a lawyer who was later to become a city politician. The part of my past I had failed to rid myself of was Lem. He was in one of my classes. It was from him that I learned about the co-op when I wanted to leave the dormitory. It was also largely because of Lem that I met the people who were to be my friends throughout my university years. Lem and Rhea more or less conspired to recruit me to their organization. It took me several weeks to figure out that I was a fly in a spider's web. I got my first clue when, during one of Rhea's admiration sessions, she commented, You really have a highly developed consciousness. You see a lot of things the way we do implying that there were a few things about which I still had to be straightened out. I immediately asked her if she happened to know Lem Isel. The moment of silence before she answered gave her game away. When at last she said, yes, he's a good friend of ours, I knew she had known about me before I had moved to the co-op. She admitted she lacked a roommate and I had sounded ideal. She asked if I minded. I really didn't mind. I hated the dormitory and was glad to find new friends. Rhea's friend, Alec Uras, visited her every other day, and she invariably recruited my proletarian virtues to him. Alec was at least as impressed as Rhea. He was another person to whom the daughter of a worker was as exotic as a Martian. Ultimately, their conspiracy backfired. Because of me, their little university group fell apart. It would have probably have fallen apart anyway, but not the way it actually happened. Rhea was the open member of the organization. She attended all sorts of events and meetings where she announced her organization's position on the topics under discussion. Alec and Lem were secret members. All three attended organization meetings, which were frequently held at Debbie Matthews' house, but when Alec and Lem were asked if they were members, they denied it. All three pressured me to attend at least one of their meetings merely in order to see what wonderful people they all were, but I invariably turned down the invitation, passing up my chance to meet all those wonderful people. When he came to visit Rhea, Alec would tell us about his projects on the school newspaper staff. The more he talked about that, the more interested I became. He talked about professors who were being fired for refusing to sign the oath of loyalty to the state, about students who refused to take part in the military training program, about the latest speaker who had been banned from speaking on campus. He saw his role on the newspaper staff as that of a muckraker who exposed these infringements on the students' rights of speech and of assembly. He didn't see any contradiction between his newspaper campaigns and his organization's denial of all such rights. 
Alex Naivete recruited me, not to his organization, but to his campaigns. This was a project I recognized. I wanted to take part in it. I joined the newspaper staff. So did Lem.